morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Carr, and I'm the Director of Advancement and Public Engagement for the Rhode Island Historical Society. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening for Celebrating Rhode Island Heritage, Quilt History, Highlights, and Craft with Sandra Smith. Before introducing Ms. Smith, I'd like to mention an ongoing initiative that may be of particular interest to this evening's audience. The Museum of Work and Culture is currently collecting handmade blankets in preparation for an upcoming exhibit in collaboration with Welcome Blanket and Dorcas International Institute of Rhode Island. To participate, individuals can hand make a 40 inch by 40 inch washable blanket and write a corresponding welcome note sharing a story important to their family relating to immigration or relocation. Blankets can be of any medium as long as they are handmade and new. These blankets and notes will be exhibited in the Museum of Working Culture's Changing Gallery in September 2024. Following the exhibit, all blankets and notes will be gifted to Dorcas International Institute of Rhode Island to welcome new refugees as they enter the United States. The museum will accept blankets until May 15th. Blankets can be hand-delivered to any Rhode Island Historical Society location, including the Museum of Working Culture, the John Brown House Museum, and the Aldrich House. Full details can be found on our website, which we will place in the chat in just a moment. And now on to this evening's program. Sandra Smith is a Maryland-based textile artist and quilter who has been sewing since childhood, creating her first quilt in the early 1980s and transitioning to making decorative hanging quilts later. Smith's work has been featured in exhibits and publications since the 1990s, as well as in private art collections. She has won multiple awards, including first place for best reflection of a theme from the East Coast Quilters Alliance and the Potomac Craft Council Award. Please join me in welcoming Sandra Smith. All right. Well, thank you, Connor and Sarah, and thanks to everyone uh, for joining this conversation today. Um, I'm going to um, feature a lot of people from, from the quilt that I made, but what I want to say about the people is that, you know, the more I learned about them, the more I came to appreciate that the folks here are extremely impressive and they're very multi, they're multi-talented. I would find that they could do X and then I would find Y, Z and, and W. So anyway, my talk is going to give you a really, really tiny a glimpse into these folks' lives and accomplishments. And I'd say it would be well worth your, your while to, after this, to go and learn more about them. So I have, um, within the presentation, I have summaries of each person, which you can find on my website in the collections area after the talk, if you want to go there and see. And also, I tried to tell the truth and I tried to get this, the uh, facts straight, but if anybody sees anything that I need to fix, please let me know. I, I um, And you can do that through my website as well. Now, I can see me, but I can't see my presentation. If you just hit the share screen button, you should be able to share your screen. All right, here we go. <clears throat> so um, you learned a little about, about me uh, a moment ago, but I need to confess, I'm a fabricaholic and I'm suffering from what they call quilt pox. I have this insatiable urge to buy fabric wherever I go. My sewing career started with making toy, uh, clothes for my Barbie doll, and then I started making clothes for myself. I got hooked on quilting back in the 80s. I have um, work in both public and private collections. I do work on commission, and I make quilts just because. Ricky, pictured over here, my husband is my cheerleader, my critic, my promoter, my Vanna White, and he's my stash security when I go and buy things and I, they need to be protected. Here's a picture of my workspace, a part of my workspace. And what I have here is a domestic sewing machine. These are notebooks. I keep records of all the quilts I make, the time I spent and what kind of fabric I use, et cetera. 
And then my 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 stash is organized um, by type. I have Japanese fabrics, African fabrics, hand dyed fabrics, Indonesian batiks, etc. I got lots of stuff. So back in January of 2009, I got an email from Ashley Tully. And in it, she said that um, she worked at Roger Williams and they were building, constructing this building called Global Heritage Hall. And the, the building was going to house for faculty offices and it was going to have multiple classrooms in it that were dedicated to these particular um, demographics, cultural um, heritage people. Um, they couldn't do everybody, but that's who they picked. And they wa wanted me to represent the African-American heritage in the classroom that I was assigned to. And what they also wanted was for every piece of artwork in each room to be um, have a depiction of what they called round heritage symbols or medallions. And those had to be included in the piece. And they were to complement um, this atrium area where they have a map of the world and each of these little round circles represents one of those medallions. She sent me the medallions for Africa. She sent me some samples from the Americas. And this is the building, pretty neat building. So I'm like, oh no, where do I start? You know, it's 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 January and they want this thing in July and it's got to be five feet by five feet. That ain't much time. I work full time, but yo, they picked me and I can do it. So what I did is I started making lists of all the important African-Americans that I knew in the world. And I went to the internet and I got articles from some of these sources and others. I called my friends from Rhode Island. This lady up front here is Janice Cooper. She might be on the call. She uh, lived in, in Newport. And so there's my mother and my husband and I with Janice. So Janice, like, Janice, who, who do you know? She said, well, my eighth grade history teacher is somebody that you ought to get in touch with. That's Mr. Paul Gaines. And between him and the college and, um, and, um, Janice, they introduced me to Mr. Keith Stokes, the historian, and then my former hairstylist is also from the area. So with, with the help of all those guys, I put together a list of Rhode Island and national folks by categories. And when they um, were in the area and some of my their achievements and where I could go find the information after the fact. So these are some of my Rhode Island folks and these are some of my national folks. I thought maybe some of those national folks passed through Rhode Island at one point or another. I don't think anybody on my list did, or well, they didn't make the list anyway. So anyway, I put together a proposal and by um, late February, I had the words. I'm like, thanks a lot. Um, I'm really excited. This is what it's going to look like. This is what kind of fabric is going to be in it. Blah, 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 blah. And I thought, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. There ain't nothing like the real thing. So I made them a sample. And the person that I chose to create the sample from is uh, Mr. Edward Bannister. He's famous for landscapes and seascapes. And he's one of the first African-Americans to win a major national award. The picture, the painting of his that I used for my sample was is named Under the Woods. And so I made a couple of trees and I made a palette with paint on it and a paintbrush, put a label on the back and sent it along. And lo and behold, I got hired. Now I'm thinking, what do I do? How do I make sure I tell the truth? I'm really on the hook now because this thing is going to be on exhibit forever. So I reached out to Mr. Stokes and Mr. Gaines. And I tell you, if it wasn't for those guys, I would have been sunk. They gave me some really, really helpful advice. And based on their advice, um, I came up with a list of proposed squares. Some of these folks made it and some of them didn't for various reasons. 
And then what I did is I made a little map for myself and I put banister in the middle and I put those medallions around and I, I assigned squares to certain people. And then construction started in February. I started with the one I'd already done with the banister one. Here's a picture of Mr. Bannister. The next one of the other interesting people that's on this quilt is Miss Matilda Cicerita Joyner Jones. And uh, Cicerita Jones was a soprano. She was an opera singer and she was named, sometimes they called her Black Patty, that named after an Italian opera singer whose name is Adelina Patty. But Miss Patty um, studied at the, uh, I mean, Miss Jones studied at the New England Conservatory and the Providence Academy of Music. She traveled all over the world singing with her troops and she got a lot of gifts and her gifts, some of them came in the form of medals. And she wore these on her dress when she performed. So I thought, all right, I'm going to draw a picture of, of um, Sister Rita for my square, my Sister Rita square. What you're looking at is a horrible drawing. This is supposed to be her facing out to the audience. And these are supposed to be the people in the audience. Terrible, terrible, terrible. So I reached out for help from another friend. This is my friend Paige who's a graphic artist, and Paige went to work drawing some of the characters on the quilt. And I think this is a much better rendition of Cicerita um, <laughs> than mine. So then I started making her, right? And this was my first Cicerita, and I'm thinking, boy, that is really sad. That ain't going to make it. It's not good. But let me let me try some stuff. So I tried putting her on different backgrounds and... Then I thought, well, let me make some medals. And after I made them, I couldn't figure out how the heck they were ever going to last forever or fit under a, in a glass um, frame. And this boa that I got, I think at Joanne Fabrics or something, I thought would disintegrate pretty fast. So what I did is I turned it all into fabric. And this is the Cicerita Jones Square. Another interesting woman that, that I met in my travels through Rhode Island is Duchess Quimino, who was also known as the pastry queen of Rhode Island. And she lived and worked in, she was enslaved in the home of William Channing. And that home is on 24th School Street in Newport. And so she baked and that's what she did for a living. Um, this slide that I made, back in 09 said the house still stands there. So I went and looked it up and I can show you a picture of the house in a moment. But for just about every piece on each of the squares in the, in the quilt, I start with a drawing and I try to make the drawing, I size the drawing so it will fit into the square. And this is the square, this red area for Duchess Quimino. Then what I do is I take my drawing and I make, I trace it onto a plastic template, mylar template. And so that makes a, a, a pattern piece for me. So I've got the cupcake frosting here in, in uh, plastic. Then I use a, um, a, a uh, material called Wonder Under, which is two-sided, It comes on a roll and it has a sticky side and a paper side. And I iron the sticky side to the wrong side of the fabric. So there's a bolt of my wonder under, and this is the paper side. And so I iron that to the wrong side of the fabric. But before, yeah. And then after I've done that, then I take my little plastic pattern piece and I trace it and I cut out the shape. And then I place the shape on the, the background that it's going to be affixed to. And usually I pin all of this stuff before I actually iron it on. Ironing is like, that's the last step. And once you iron it, it's kind of difficult to get it off, but it's possible. So I first thought that um, the Duchess cupcake was going to be on a piece of fine china. But then I decided to make two cupcakes. I like that better. And there's my finished cupcakes, along with little tea napkins. 
And for each of the squares, what I did is I quilted. This is quilting stitching here. And that holds the, the layers of the quilt together, the back, the batting, and the top. So there's Duchess Clamino with her little crown. And uh, Roger Williams um, had an, an event called uh, where they honored the women of East Bay. And they did, couldn't find a picture of the Duchess. So they borrowed my, my quilt square picture and they made a puzzle and they gave it to me, which is really cool. And there's the house. So this is a picture from Redfin Realty back in 2018. I think the house had some renovations, but it's there's a house there on that corner. Another lady that I want you all to meet is Miss Lashy Mangum. And Miss Mangum, um, I was at, at, well, actually this lady at the bottom used to be my hairstylist. And I was talking to Sharon about the project for Rhode Island for the for the school and she said you know my grandmother's an important person and she lived there too maybe we can put her on the quilt and I said yeah we can let's do it so we found a picture and Paige made me a um a drawing of um Miss Mangum because what is important about her is she and her husband migrated from Carolina up to Rhode Island and they worked at the Walsh Kaiser Shipyard in Providence. And she was the first African-American female welder. Her husband worked there as well. And they lived there for a long time. Some of their family members are still there to this day. And so here's my drawing of what we call I call uh, welder woman. And these are the pieces uh, made out of fabric of uh, Miss Mango in her welder uniform. And there's her finished square. So that's pretty neat. And it was really neat to, to know somebody who was related to somebody on the quilt. So Sharon um, and her family, immediate family came up and Miss Mangum's folks who lived down in Carolina, her two sons and her daughter joined me for the opening of the building. And that was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And then what happened is in October of last year, I got a phone call from her grandson. It's like the quilt that never ends. And he said he wanted a quilt to honor his grandmother with a picture of grandma and welder woman on it. And so he wanted the, the um, her on top and, and um, the welder on the bottom, but that's what I did. So I got out all my stuff. I never threw anything away. And here's my drawing, and here are my various pieces um, that I, I remade. And this is um, her square underneath my sewing machine. I'm sewing around the edges. And in order to make sure that people knew she was a woman, because, you know, I had to have hair sticking out of the sides on, on both. <laughs> Not that you would do that if you were welding. And there's uh, it in progress. And there's the finish. Miss Lashy Mango, number two. Another very interesting group of people are the first Rhode Island Regiment. These were a group of um, both free men and slaves who were enlisted by George Washington to fight in the Revolutionary War. And they fought the British in what they call the Battle of Rhode Island, which is in Portsmouth. And because of the distinguished work that those guys did, the General Assembly of Rhode Island passed what they called the Negro Emancipation Act. And what that did was it provided gradual emancipation for slaves in Rhode Island. And what happened is if, if you were a male born to slaves, you'd be free at 21. And if you were a female, you'd be free at 18. I wasn't sure when I was doing my research which kind, which of these represented the uniforms that the folks actually wore. So we drew pictures of both uniforms, but I decided the one on the left would be easier to sew. So that's the one I went with. But here's a picture of the drawing, and here's the picture of my template. And I had to make, I made the whole body, and then I made pieces for each of the body parts. And over here, you see a picture of 
this is the back side of a piece of fabric with wonder under on it. I think it might be brown. It might have been used to make one of their faces. So here they are kind of lined up and I'm layering the pieces to figure out how they'll go together. And then I placed them on the background square and tried to organize them in some sort of fashion that would work. I, at this point, wonder, I've fused them, I've ironed them down to the background and I'm starting to sew their, um, the outline for their, their um, shirt and their pants and I've sewed around their collars. And there's more progress and now they're done. They're pretty cool. I like them. I like the way they stand up so tall. Mr. William Downing owned property in Newport, and he owned property in what, what is now and was back then called Downing Block. It's on Bellevue Avenue. This guy was um, known as one of the wealthiest African Americans in the United States at that particular time. And he opened a hotel called The Seagirt. He also had some other retail establishments on the block. He was uh, very um, involved in working on desegregation of the pu public schools in Newport. And then, and it, during his lifetime, he also uh, was in charge of the dining room cafe at the House of Representatives here in Washington, DC. So Paige drew this for me and I really liked it. We just drew, we didn't do research on this building. I learned today that it was five stories high. But anyway, we drew this pic. She drew this picture of the hotel for me. And then she drew the uh, other retail spaces. I decided to couple them and put the hotel behind the, the other buildings. And here I'm auditioning everything for the background that I think I'm going to use for the block. And in this picture, what you can see is my templates. This is the first floor and the second floor windows. I used those for all the windows, I think. I don't remember. I don't think I was dumb enough to make one for every um, slot. But those are the windows. And this is the cutout for the curtains. And these are a couple of other pieces that I made um, plastic for. Now I didn't, these pieces are about, oh, I don't know, about an inch and a half by an in, maybe two at the most. And I didn't want to have to sew these little sashings to every single window. So I took a long strip of fabric and I um, sewed a dark line on it. And then I, I, I wonder under my curtain fabrics and then I drew on them so that I could then cut them out and place them along this strip. The next thing I did was I made a cutout of the window, which you can barely see here, but it's arched. And then what I did is I cut them all out and one by one, I made each window and I sewed each window down. And that must have been a good week's worth of work, I think. Then what I did is I auditioned this fabric that has um, sailboats on. I thought that's perfect, Newport. And there's what the end product looked like. I was loving my friend for making the beautiful um, picture, but I was hating her because of all these itty bitty pieces. But I think it turned out pretty special. And there's Mr. Downey. And here's where you can see the stitching for the um, this bottom area of the square. Miss Yates graduated from Rogers High School. And I noticed during my research, a lot of people in my um, quilt went to Rogers High School. This lady um, was pretty interesting because she was trained in um, chemistry. And she was one of the first black professors to be hired by Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri. She also became the first black woman to head a college science department. Another interesting thing about this woman is that she also was a journalist and she wrote articles for a magazine called Women's Era and it was the first monthly magazine published by black women in the United States. So what I did with Miss Yates is I borrowed this lovely lady here as my um, 
my my you know my my what do you call it she was she became her <laughs> i used her to make uh, miss yates and i used these little this little ball idea to kind of make what i thought looked like i don't know scientific thingies and so since she was a, a teacher i made a blackboard or a green board with a an eraser etc and there's miss yates Eleanor um, Keyes and Keith Stokes are both historians who dedicated much of their life to sharing Black history in Rhode Island. Um, this says that I think when I wrote this, that might be what Mr. Mr. Stokes was doing. But I looked up today and see that he's currently the vice president of the 1619 Heritage Group, which is an historical consulting firm, firm in Newport. And these guys did a lot of work, and he still does a lot of work, uh, promoting positive images, positive inf information of Black history and Black people in Rhode Island and Newport. And without Mr. Stokes and all the things that the readings that I got from his work, I wouldn't have made it. But here's a picture of their square in progress. My thought process was that since they were historians and they had to search around for information, I would make a magnifying glass because they are like detectives trying to get the facts. And um, I um, was going to, I wanted to show that they did writing and I was going to use Greeking, but I thought, that is, I don't know about Greeking. And then I, since they look back in history, I got a picture, this is my grandmother here, and this is another family picture that I put on their square. And I thought, all right, they wrote a lot, so let me do writing, but scribbling just wasn't, didn't give them justice. So I um, took some words from an article that Mr. Stokes had written, and I put some of his words on these pieces, and that's the Keith Stokes and Eleanor Keys quilt. Quilt block. And you can see here, this is some of the quilting stitches that I did around the edges. And here I use what we call uh, variegated thread. It changes colors every inch or two inches, depending on what you're using. And that way you can kind of blend things that don't otherwise blend. And here was my buddy, Mr. Paul Gaines, the first and only black mayor of Newport, as he described himself. And one of the important things that Mr. Mr. Gaines did was to um, help uh, work on a movement to get a monument erected to the um, Black Regiment. And he actually made it. He is part of the entrance to the Patriots Park where they have the memorial. Here's the memorial. Here's a close up. These are the names of the various folks that were part of the, the regiment. Here's a stone in honor of them. And here, some of the inscription talks about who the people were who were part of that group and um, notes about the, the battles that they fought. This is the back side of the monument. And if you want to go there, here's how you get there. It's at 24, 24th and West Main Street road there's there's the mayor since he was so important we gave him the key to the city and put a top hat on him and these are uh, the pieces that i used to make his square and he also since he was in newport got this cool sailboat fabric behind him and here what i did is i outlined some of the boats and then i sort of squiggled around the rest of the square. I don't know if you ever got to see it. Um, Miss, uh, Miss Marcus Wheatland, this guy actually married George Downing's granddaughter. So I don't know if he had money, but he got, he, he married into wealth. And he's considered to be the first um, African-American physician to live and to practice in Newport. He also um, was at an, an acclaimed uh, radiologist. And so I thought radiologist, x-rays, 
oh, I'll get pictures of hands. And this is my hand. And I was trying to figure out how to get my hand to look like these hands. And it wasn't working. So then what I did is I looked, I thought maybe x-rays of the of the lungs and the chest. So I did that. And then I borrowed Ricky's head, my husband, and I traced him and I put him here. And this is supposed to be a fancy dancy x-ray machine. And because he was a doc, I stuck in a stethoscope. Then I called my neighbor, who's a cardiac nurse, and said, Karen, where should the heart be? So we put the little itty bitty heart there. And she said, drop that stethoscope. It, it, it's crappy. Get rid of it. So we did. And there's Mr. Mr. Wheatland. God's Little Acre is an historically significant black burial ground. And um, what is interesting about this place is that it's been noted to have some of the oldest collection of markers of freed Africans and slaves. And it dates back, and they date back to about the 1600s. And there was a guy named Zingo Stevens, who was a stone cutter there and a slave. And he signed his name to his brother's headstone. And that signature is thought to be maybe one of the oldest recorded African-American artists' signature. There was, as they called him, a colored undertaker at God's Little Acre named Mintus Thurston. And I represent him on the quilt block as well. And a lot of the ladies back in the day were named Violet, as I learned. So there's my, my Violets. This, I think, is actually Mintus's headstone. And this is another headstone from God's Little Acre. Here I'm auditioning the, the pictures to figure out, all right, how am I going to put them onto the quilt? And here is that particular square in progress where I've sewn around some of the flowers. I made a headstone and named it for a lady, a fictitious lady named Violet. There's Mintus and there's Zingo. This lady... Nancy Prophet was the first African American to graduate from RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, with a degree in painting and freehand drawing, and said that she spent a lot of her career in exile, but then she became um, renowned for her sculpting. So we drew, Paige drew pictures of what might be sculpted items. And I choose to, chose to use this, this head. And these are our little wood chips. And here again, I've quilted this totally different than the rest of the squares. Each of the squares you might notice have this black background around it. And that's what I, we call sashing. So there's sashing in between and separating each of the squares. Um, a couple of ladies, Miss Tanner and Miss um, Lena, were instrumental in um, organizing the Female Benevolent, Benevolent Society, which was focused on uh, furthering education for Black people in the area. And what I learned just this week, actually, is Miss Tanner corresponded with Phyllis Wheatley. And you might know Phyllis Wheatley is, was a, a, a poet, and she's said to be one of the first African-American authors to have a published poetry book. What's also interesting is that Miss Tanner corresponded with Miss Wheatley. And they have uh, the Massachusetts Historical Society has some of the letters that Wheatley wrote to Tanner. They don't have any letters of Tanner going to Wheatley. But what we did here is we decided that we would use um, Embracing arms, we put um, bangles on them so we'd know that they were women, not men. And these are my wondered, um, this is one of the wondered under arms. You can sort of see some of the wonder under sticking out. And I put the arms on this fabric. And this background fabric is actually a piece of African fabric. It's pretty, but the thing about it is when you iron it, this... Um, light purple melts, so I ditched it. And I used a piece of just plain cotton batik. 
and there's the African Female Benevolence Society. Mr. Maracu is also known as the Newport Gardener. He got to um, Newport when he was about 13 and he was owned by the Gardner family. And his owner named him Newport Gardner because he lived in Newport and their last name was Gardner. This fellow taught and composed music. He was a renowned um, musician and he was really, really unhappy here. And so he led a group of people of Africans from Newport and Boston, and, and they returned back to Liberia, but he passed away shortly after he got home. There's um, Mr. Maracu, and I made flowers. I made this sort of look like a floral gardening kind of uh, arrangement, and there he is. John Brown Watson. John Brown Watson. Uh, was one of the earliest African-American alumni of Brown University. And he was at, uh, was the president of, of um, what's now the University of Arkansas in Pine, Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And um, he wrote, he had a lot of uh, papers. I tried to look one up the other day because this one here, he wrote a paper about the role of the African-American woman as a Christian homemaker and a community leader in, in, the, in education, I thought, wow, what does an African-American Christian homemaker do back in those days? Who knows? But anyway, he wrote a lot of stuff and his books it, and his writings are housed at, at, uh, at Brown. So I represented him as um, book with books and bookshelves. And there's Mr. Watson, and here are his writings. Reverend Van Horn was a minister, a legislator, and a diplomat. And he was uh, the pastor of Union Congregational Church. Um, he was one of the first black people to serve on the Newport School Committee. And he was also the first black to serve in the Rhode Island legislature. And he did a lot of other stuff as you can see. So I represented him with a pulpit and a choir. Here's Mr. Van Horn. And there they are. I've used this choir a couple of times in some other quilts. I kind of like them. The Congdon, Congdon Street Baptist Church. I looked these guys up and I think they have a website. And if you go to their website, they do a, a fabulous job of describing their history, um, much better than I'm going to do right now. But they were, um, in 1819, um, they established their congregation. And their congregation was established with the, with the idea of providing a place for Black people to be educated and also to worship. And in 1820, that um, building was open for worship. Now, around this time, around the 1840s, what happened was all these people, these were a group of um, multiple denominations. And around 1840, they separated and um, only one group, the Calvinists were, were left and they organized the Meeting Street Baptist Church. Somewhere between 1863 and 70, a group of hostile neighbors um, tore down that church and it got, but they persisted and it was rebuilt in 1875. Um, no, sorry. It was down here's when it got, got um, torn down and rebuilt. Up here, they changed the name from the Meeting Baptist Church to the Con Congdon Church. Anyway, they have services still on Sundays. I looked them up and you can go virtually or in person to that church and truly go to their website. They have an extremely, really um, detailed explanation of their history. It's really quite interesting. 
here's the picture I used to draw the, to make the church. And I, I, I can't remember whether this podium was going to be part of that square or part of um, somebody else's, but things when I'm working kind of like move around. Here I use some hand dyed fabrics, which are kind of gloomy. I, I, I thought, oh gosh, this is just really, really sad, really gloomy. Here along um, the, the stained glass window is a sort of a cording, a cotton cording that I used to make the window. After I finished it, I thought, nah, I don't like it. So I use much more um, upbeat fabrics for the Condon's church. Frederick Williamson was is a fellow that was born in Lowell, Massachusetts and moved and went to Providence when he was about 14. He died at 95 years old, but prior to um, his job, he was a state of Rhode Island historic preservation officer. Prior, and he did that. He's one of the, the longest people with that particular title and job in the country. At one point, he had a jewelry business, and at another um, part of his career, he was a, um, a civilian employee in the Navy. He was a um, chairman of the Rhode Island Historical Commission at one point in his life as well. And since he was a preservationist, we did represented him with preserved jars. Here's Mr. Williamson. And here are his jars in progress. And here's his finished square. Mr. Hopkins, Mr. Triplett, and Mr. Cross all um, created um, Boy Scout troops, one in Providence and one in Newport. I could only find a picture of Mr. Triplett. I couldn't find the other guys. But we did them. We made them uh, a little Boy Scout camp, complete with rocks around the fire and little tents. And here are the tents in progress. I used fabrics that look like the ground and trees and fire and rocks. And they're moving quite a, right along and moving right along. And ultimately I quilted them with thread that, that is fiery looking. This fellow, really handsome guy. This guy, one of the things, he, he was a physician, a radiologist, a novelist, a story writer, a dramatist, a musician, and an orator. I decided to key in on his writing. He was born in D.C. and he grew up in Providence. He attended Brown University. And one of the books that he wrote was called The Conjure Man Dies. I actually bought it and I, it's on my bookshelf. I haven't, haven't read it yet. But anyway, um, he wrote one of the first uh, it, um, black detective novels. This black this novel was a murder mystery that took place in Harlem. And there he is, really handsome dude. These are a couple of his books. These are his books in fabric. And the last person on my quilt is Fritz Pollard. He also graduated from Brown University, and he had a lot of firsts. He was the first of two African-American players in the NFL. He became the first African-American to play in a Rose Bowl game. He was the first quarterback to win a National Football League championship. He was the first African-American coach, and he founded one of the first Black-owned security firms. And there's Mr. Pollard and his square. So that's all the squares. I've made all the squares and now I have to deal with these medallions. I decided I didn't want to use the medallions, the um, those African ones that, that the client asked for. I was going to use something round like the, the um, state flag. So here I've got all those little flags. Why I did it, I don't know, because there's so many stars on there. It made me go, go blind. But I then said, oh, let me take these, this quilt down and show it to Paige and show her how her drawings became fabric. 
there we are all happy. And these are some of the blocks that she helped design. Sent a note to Ashley and said, I'm done. Take a look. And she's like, no, you ain't. I asked you for medallions. <laughs> and you have to fix it because that's what I asked for. And it's true. So I went searching for medallions. And there I am with them on the floor in my, in my room. Here's one of the templates for one of them. And there's a finished one. Here I used um, this uh, metallic cording and stitched over it so that you could see the, the twirlies in the, the square. Here's another one of my template pieces. Here I have it sitting on the blue fabric, but I like brown better, so I, I changed it. And there's that one finished. Here's another one. Here's the fourth one in progress. And there it is finished. And so then I put everything around. You see the sashing, you see the <clears throat> the medallions. And I'm at this point putting a black and white fabric around the periphery of the quilt. And construction is done and I'm happy. So then what I have to do is what we call um, pinning um, the top so that I can affix the batting and the backing to the quilt. So here is the batting. This is the top and there's a back fabric on the table and there's hundreds of pins in this thing. And what I did then is I used one of my flags and made it a, a um, what do you call it? A label on the back of the quilt. And here it is all rolled up, ready to get put into my domestic sewing machine so that I can quilt inside all of these little squares. And there it is. And I finished. And then we went off to the classroom to see the quilt in, in um, you know, its new home. And this is the vantage point that the professor has. And these are some of the art pieces that are in that classroom. And here's Ashley and I, happy, looking at the uh, now framed in the classroom quilt. And there it is. And just to give you guys a sense of what happened over time, because I showed you things out of order, this is what my design board looked like in early March with the various squares in some, some level of progress. And this was in the morning on March 30th. And by the afternoon, things had moved around. And here we are in April, late next day. Each day, things sort of moved around until finally um, I got everything made. And everything, um, here's where I still have my crazy uh, flags. But I've seen the light by the early part of May. And by the end of May, everything and early June, I'm done. And there we are. And I thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. That was so wonderful. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Uh, if anyone has any, feel free to send them to the chat and I can read them for you. Or if you raise your hand on Zoom, I can. I see Ramona is waving her hand, so I will just ask her to unmute so she can ask her question. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm with Around Black Storytellers, and I have too many questions to ask in the little time I have. Okay. I just want to let you know that we have a story camp for young people. And you have inspired me so oh, I'm much. Wait, wait as, I'm on the Zoom. Oh. Um, I uh inspire me uh for what I can guide our young people who are with Rhode Island Black storytellers and we're showing our culture in all the many ways in which we preserve our stories. And I'm gonna wrap it up by saying Chapunto, which is stuffing the fabric. <laughs> uh. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions for Sandra? Again, feel free to send them along in the chat or raise your hand on Zoom and I can call on you. And if anyone wants to look at the summaries again um, about each of the people, because I skipped a lot of stuff and I went quickly. If you go to my collections, the collections area of my website and you click on the picture of the quilt, it will bring up a page that has uh, pictures of each of the squares and the summaries. And Sarah just sent that along in the chat for everyone. Thank you. While we're waiting for other questions to come in, Sandra, what was it like to revisit this project, what, 15 years after working on it? Yes, yeah, so I used to be able to spout all those facts just off the top of my head. I'm like, oh, I don't remember. Um, so I, I did some further research and, and this time I had time because I wasn't in a hurry to make anything to actually read further about the various people. And I'm telling you, they're just phenomenal people. Everybody, everybody did a lot of great things. Great, thank you so much. And Myra Paul asks, what machines do you use for piecing and for quilting? If you did quilting on each square, how did you assemble the whole? So I assemble and I quilt using a Bernina sewing machine. It's a domestic sewing machine. So that's what I that's what I use for both the piecing and the quilting. And, and the, one of the one of the interesting things about this quilt was I had planned on farming it out to a quilter somebody who actually does that and enjoys that. And at that time in my life, I hated that part, but I like it now. And that was the beginning of my liking it because the lady fell down at church and busted her wrists and wasn't able to do the quilting for me. So I was forced to do it myself, which I, I like what I did. Do we have any other questions for Sandra? Oh, Ramona. Ramona. <laughs> I just wanted to say the pronunciation of Miss Jones's name is Ciceretta. Ciceretta, thank you. All right. And it seems like everyone is just saying thank you so much for being here. And I extend the same feeling. Thank you so much, Sandra. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us this evening. If we have no other questions, I hope you have a lovely rest of your night. And we hope to see you again soon at another RIHS program.